So we'll wait five minutes so that more crowd. Oh, some more crowd. Sure, sure, yeah. Take your time. Please have a seat. I'm You're sitting fine. around all day, so I think better just move a bit. <laughs> So, Professor Pidaki is a professor at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Japan. So, his group at uh, that institute, uh, the Fluid Mechanics Unit, works on theoretical, experimental, and computational studies on turbulent flows, atmospheric flows, geological flows, and uh, granular flows. Prior to joining this university, he was uh, uh, he was at Illinois, in the US, uh, first at the Department of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics, where he received his PhD in 2006, and then at the Department of Geology, where he was a postdoctoral fellow and later a research assistant professor. So now he is a professor at uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Japan. Uh, so looking at his uh, you know, vast experience in fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics, and a lot of interesting publication in very high-end journals, it made me dizzy, basically. <laughs> So he is going to talk today, and I think he's recently working on tropical cyclones. So surprising thermodynamics of landfalling hurricanes. Very good. So welcome, Professor Pinaki. Warm welcome to IITM. Thank you very much. So over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. Thank you all for coming to this talk. So I'll be talking about how landfalling hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, tropical cyclones, how they decay, and I'll try to make a case that the decay processes are controlled surprisingly by moist thermodynamics. Oh, should, should I move this up? Is this better? Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try to make a case that. So I'll try to make a case that um, surprisingly moist thermodynamics plays a key role in determining how landfalling hurricanes decay. So I'll just use the word hurricanes, uh, but of course the general word is tropical cyclones. So this work that I'll describe today, uh, this formed a part of the PhD thesis of Lin Lee, who was a student in my group, and now is a postdoc in Reken in a meteorological institute. Um, before I get started, let me start with a caveat. I am not a meteorologist. I don't have a background in meteorology. I barely know what I'm talking about. So my background is fluid mechanics, turbulent flows. Uh, Lin's background is not even fluid mechanics. His background was physics. So we are two amateurs who went into this field because of interest. Uh, so I think it will show in the way we approach the problem that we are not experts in this area. Nevertheless, I hope to convince you that there might be something interesting in what I present, and I would very much appreciate, I'm very aware I'm in front of experts in this area. I would very much appreciate your feedback if there's anything of value. Okay, so let's get started. So the interest would be about landfalling hurricanes, but hurricanes, of course, are born over ocean. They grow over warm ocean. So let's start with hurricanes over ocean. And here's just a very simple schematic of a hurricane over ocean. And uh, It's a gigantic vertical structure. As you know, the radius of a hurricane is of the order of hundreds of kilometers. It spans all the way from the surface of the ocean all the way to tropopause, so let's say around 15 kilometers. So we're talking about a gigantic vortex. And if we ask what's the basic energetics of a hurricane over ocean at a mature state, well, this goes back to many people have worked in this area, primarily Kerry Emanuel. Uh, it goes back to the idea of treating a mature hurricane as a heat engine. And in this, actually, Manuel model is like a Carnot heat engine. But regardless, it's a heat engine. And in this notion of a heat engine, treating hurricane as a heat engine, the idea is hurricane is fueled by the moisture from the ocean. And what the heat engine does is it transforms the heat energy, which is basically the latent heat of moisture, into mechanical energy, which are winds of the hurricane. So that's the basic idea, the simple idea of a hurricane over ocean. Moist thermodynamics is at the heart of a hurricane over ocean. Well, this simple conceptual picture can be very useful to make predictions as to what happens, for example, in a warming climate. In a warming climate, sea surface temperature is higher, atmospheric temperature is also higher. And of course, because of the Clausius-Clapeyron relation, the warmer air can store more moisture. 
So warmer climate makes conditions conducive to have stronger hurricanes. That's why global warming is a major concern in terms of hurricanes. And if one looks at certain ways to look at the data, one of the ways is from Jim Carson, about the proportion of major hurricanes over time, we can see that over time, the proportion of major hurricanes has been increasing. There are certain other features also of hurricanes that one can look at and see that it's been changing with time, increasing with time. Although I must add that there are some other features for which we don't see a trend. So for example, number of hurricanes, we don't see any systematic trend with years. So it depends on what kind of stuff that we are looking at because hurricane is not just affected by one thing, is of course affected by a conjugation of many, many things. If we focus on not just hurricanes over ocean, but hurricanes over land. So here is just one simple analysis we did, which is we looked at the intensity of hurricanes that were making landfall from North Atlantic hurricanes. So these are North Atlantic hurricanes that are making landfall in North America on the East Coast. And we asked, how does we know that the fraction of hurricanes, major hurricanes has been increasing over time, but these are over ocean. Only a small fraction, fortunately, make landfall. What about the intensity of those hurricanes that are making landfall? And what you find is that basically it's a flat trend. In other words, fortunately for us, although we have more intense hurricanes over ocean, the ones that make landfall, they are being unaffected by climate change. So is it that we are very lucky that we have no effect in landfalling hurricanes for climate change? Or is it that this is not the only way to look at the effect of climate on landfall and hurricane. So we shall investigate this problem in further detail. Okay, so let me first start with a conceptual picture for what happens to a landfalling hurricane. Unfortunately, there's a very, very simple model to think about a landfalling hurricane, which can be realized on a tabletop, basically in your cup of tea, coffee, whatever. The idea is we can think that a hurricane over ocean is a cup of tea that is being stirred. And that stirring is provided by the ocean moisture, which is providing all the energetics for the hurricane. But once a hurricane makes landfall, that source of moisture has been cut off. So the stirring, the forcing has stopped. And what you have then is sort of like this cup of tea that was stirred before, which was the hurricane over ocean. And now that experiences friction against this surface, also on the side surfaces, but let's ignore that. So the bottom friction, slows down the hurricane, and that's basically the model we have conceptually for landfalling hurricanes. A landfalling hurricane decays because of what is called a spin down vortex, because of friction with the ground underneath. That's why understanding friction is such a key thing for predicting how a hurricane would decay. In this model of a spin down vortex, thermodynamics plays no role. The notion is that when the hurricane is over ocean, it's a heat engine. Ocean moisture is coming in, condensing, and driving the energetics of the hurricane. But when a hurricane makes landfall, it's decaying because of friction due to the ground. So it's a non-thermodynamic system, the key dynamics being friction with the ground, spinning down because of friction with the ground. So let's keep that in mind as we go through the data. Here is a famous and famous case of Hurricane Katrina, which made landfall in New Orleans in 2005. And this is the path Hurricane Katrina took. And on the right, I'm showing the intensity, which is the maximum winds in a hurricane right near the eye wall of a hurricane. Past landfall. So it made landfall around category three, 60 meters per second. And what you can see, is the first day past landfall, the hurricane intensity decays very, very rapidly. And after that, the rate of decay slows down. Hurricane Katrina was also one of those cases that causes a lot of flooding and other damages. About 1,800 people died and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in damages. So an infamous case of uh, how much damage a hurricane can cause. And most of the damages caused by a hurricane is within the first day past landfall because this is where the intensity decays maximum. If you look at how the intensity decays first day past landfall, it can be pretty well captured by empirically by an exponential decay. So V is the intensity at any time T, 
T equals zero is the landfall time, and V zero is the intensity at landfall. And this decays as e to the power minus t, t is again the time pass landfall, divided by some time scale tau. I'm going to focus on this time scale tau. This is the decay time scale tau. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use HERDAC data, Atlantic HERDAC data. This is actually from the Atlantic HERDAC data. It is data that is spaced every six hours, gives you the intensity. And I'm going to take the first day pass landfall, I'm going to fit an exponential curve, and there's only one fitting parameter there, and that fitting parameter is the TK time scale. So for each hurricane that makes landfall over a large period of time, I'm going to calculate the TK time scale. And what I'm going to ask is, is there a time trend, a systematic trend in the TK time scale? That's where I'm going. Okay, so what do I do? I take a white eye I made my poor student, Lindley, he took a lot of this data uh, from 1967 to the time he stopped his PhD, 2018. So it's about 50 years of data. We started at 67 because in the North Atlantic heritage, this is where the satellite data became very reliable. So we have very reliable data starting from 1967. And here are a whole bunch of tracks that we have plotted. And I have colored them differently within the first 25 and the next 25 years, just to show that you know there isn't any very clear systematic trend in the tra in the tracks of a hurricane. So each of the hurricanes that I've plotted here meets two criteria. The two criteria it meets is first, at the point of landfall, the intensity was at least hurricane level intensity. So it made landfall at least as a category one hurricane. And second criteria is that past landfall, it stayed over land at least for one day. So if a hurricane came in and then went back into <laughs> ocean, then its dynamics would be affected by going back into ocean. So we excluded that data. Okay, so I take all the hurricanes over a period of 50 years that satisfy these two criteria. And then for each of those hurricanes, I calculate the DK time scale. Now, the decay time scale for individual hurricanes can be affected by a whole bunch of factors. What I'm looking for is the trend over this multiple decades, over 50 years. Is there a trend over 50 years? And to reduce the effect of noise, we performed a whole range of smoothing operations, and I can talk about that, but the data that I'll show you, we perform smoothing, which is very typical in this kind of analysis, which is a three-year window applied twice. OK, so what I'm doing is over this three year window applied twice, I'm averaging all of the tau for the different hurricanes, tau being the decay time scale. And I'm going to plot that as a function of time. Before I show you the plot, you can already imagine what you're going to see. These hurricanes are making landfall. You have already seen there is no trend at all in the intensity of the hurricanes that are making landfall. And after that, it's just land. It's friction against land, and there is no trend that some hurricanes are making landfall of one year over here, one year over here, and so forth. So it's not that the friction is all that different over the time we are talking about. We should see a boring flat curve. That's what we should see. And when Lynn showed me the data, what I saw was this. PK past landfall over from 1968 to 2018. What you see is that there's a systematic trend. So the line that you're seeing, this solid gray line, is all the data for each of the hurricanes that are making landfalls smoothened. What you see as the error bars are the standard error of the mean. So what you can see is that the trends that we are seeing, it always the trends are overwhelming any little variations that you may have from one hurricane to another. So you have systematic trends. The dotted lines that you're seeing are the 95% confidence interval. And this is the linear trend line. If we just follow the linear trend line, what we see is that 50 years ago, a hurricane took 17 hours to decay to an intensity one over E. <coughs> now it takes 33 hours to decay the same one over E. 
there's a systematic increase in the decay time scale. Put differently, decay of hurricanes over the years have slowed down. Decay has become slower. And it's not a monotonic trend. There are interesting ups and downs around this monotonic trends. And notice that the amplitude of up and down is not dominated by the errors. So you can really see ups and downs, and you can also see a systematic trend. So this is far from a boring curve, but this is a curve that we are not able to understand using our framework of just a spin down model. So this intrigued us immensely. We struggled a lot to try to see how we can understand this. And one way we went around after trying many, many things is to ask, we don't expect a connection between the decay of a hurricane and climate. Because decay of a hurricane, we expect thermodynamics plays no role. Therefore, climate should not, in principle, play any role. But what if that understanding is incomplete? What if climate does play a role? Then what's the easiest thing that we can try to check? And what we did is to ask, I have no idea why it's showing up like this. Is it showing up like this yet? I'm sorry, this is, this is supposed to be North America. So you'll have to trust me on this, but what you have to, I'll try to describe, I'm sorry. I made my presentation on a Mac. I copied it onto this Windows computer and I thought, so nice, the video works but I did not check this figure. I hope this is the only one. Anyway, this is supposed to be a map of North America. Everything in here has gotten flipped down. And the square box is a box that is before, actually, let me do it this way, because this map did work. Okay, it was supposed to be exactly this map. And the square box was supposed to go over here. So we are looking at the sea surface temperature of the part where the hurricanes have traversed over before making land. So that's what this particular figure was supposed to be. I'm very sorry. I have no idea why this happened. And then hopefully the next one works. Yes, it does. Okay. Then if I plot the sea surface temperature over the years, smoothen exactly over the same time period that we did for the DK time scale, I see, of course, the sea temperature has been going up, as is well known for North Atlantic. But we also see there are ups and downs, which you may think about in terms of some oscillations, but regardless, the empirical data shows there are these ups and downs. More curiously, if you take the two curves together, here in gray is the time scale data, the DK time scale data that I showed you. And here in blue on the same graph, is the sea surface temperature data that I showed you. You can already visually see that there is a nice correlation between the two. And of course, you can do all kinds of statistical tests to check that the correlation is statistically meaningful and so forth, and we report all those kinds of tests. But I think you can already visually see these are two well-correlated data. Now, just because two things are correlated does not mean there's a causal relationship between the two, right? Correlation does not imply causation. And you can come up with various absurd examples. And because I love absurdity, here is one. In red is the age of Miss America over 1999 to 20, 2009. And in black are murders, I guess, in America. I don't know. Steam, hot vapor, and hot objects. I have no idea who collects data like this. But they do. And if you see the two curves, again, they're amazingly correlated. But it would be an absurd leap of imagination to say that there is any causal relationship between the two curves. If you like to waste time, you can just Google spurious correlations. And it's full of superbly interesting examples like this. In any event, the point being, we saw two time series that are correlated. I can't jump from there and say that there's a causal relationship between the two. To see if there might be a causal relationship, we turn to simulating hurricanes. Now, the part that I'm going to talk about simulating hurricanes is uh, I'm going to describe some axisymmetric symmetric simulations, but we have also done 3D simulations. But let me just give you kind of an overview of what we did. Uh, to get started, the origin of our coordinate system is at the center of the eye, at the surface of the ocean. 
This is my radial coordinate system R, and this is my vertical coordinate system Z. Okay. So Z R coordinate system. And if I look at the equations, the system that we use is from George Bryan. It's called Cloud Model One. Uh, NCAR maintains this code. It's it's very very nice for people like me uh, that this code is freely available. So you can download it, you can modify it, which is what my student did. So just to give a very brief overview of the code, the code solves momentum equations. These are effectively Navier-Stokes equation, but you also have Coriolis forces and you have a bunch of diffusion and damping terms in it. You have a pressure equation that's coupled with the Navier-Stokes equation. You have a temperature equation and you're also accounting for all kinds of phase changes between moisture, water, water, ice and so forth. So it's a set of rather complicated equations, but it is, of course, much simpler than what an actual hurricane is. So it's an idealized simulation of a hurricane. And what we did is we used this code and we developed hurricane from a small initial vortex over ocean of uniform temperature. Here I put the temperature as 301 Kelvin. And what you see is that the intensity of a hurricane goes up and then becomes mature for this case, around 60 meters per second, so around like a category three hurricane. So this is hurricane over ocean. Then we wanted to simulate landfall. And to simulate landfall, we just modified the code. And what we did is we just removed the ocean. Now a landfall in a real world is not that your hurricane is over ocean and boom, the hurricane is over land. Of course, it goes gradually from ocean to land. But we wanted to do a very, very simple numerical experiment where we remove the land immediately. And if you do so, and by removing the land, what I mean in the code is you just cut off all of the moisture flux and the sensible heat flux that's coming from the ocean. That's basically simulating landfall. And as you might expect, the intensity immediately decays. And in fact, you can also show that empirically, a exponential decay is a very, very good fit. R squared is something like 0.98, something like that. It's very good fit to both real data as well as the simulated hurricanes. Now, what the reason we went about doing simulations are twofold. First of all, we can completely eliminate every other factor. The question that we want to ask is if we develop hurricanes over oceans of different temperatures, we make it go to the same intensity, and then we make landfall. Am I going to see a systematic trend in how slow things decay? That's what we wanted to ask. In a real hurricane, who knows what other factors have come in, but in a simulated hurricane, we can control it. So that's what Lynn did. Here is a curve where the hurricane was developed over an ocean at 299 Kelvin. And here is another curve where a hurricane was developed over 303 Kelvin, and you can immediately see every other thing in the simulation is the same. The ground friction is the same. Every simulation parameter is the same. The only difference between these two hurricanes is that one of them was developed over a warmer ocean than the other one, subjected to landfall, and you can immediately see that the decay time scale has increased. In fact, you can do it quite systematically, if you do 3D simulations, 3D simulations are computationally expensive, so we only ran a few. So we changed the temperature from 300 Kelvin to 303, and you can see there's a monotonic increase in the decay time scale. Axis symmetric simulations are much cheaper, so you can run a whole bunch of them, and you can again see the same trend. The decay time scale keeps increasing. So there is something about the memory of the ocean that is still carried by the hurricane when it has made landfall. Something that tells us that there is a thermodynamic connection between the ocean, warmer ocean, and the hurricane making landfall, which is simply not there in the spin down vortex model. In the spin down vortex model, we shouldn't be saying any of this. It should be just a flat thing, which is purely determined by friction with the ground. Friction with the ground is exactly the same in all this hurricane. So how do we go about it? And Lynn came up with a very nice way to go about it. So this is the second reason simulations were very useful for us. So here are the two curves that I showed earlier. Then he ran duplicate simulations for 
each one of these hurricanes. And what he did is he kept the same temperature field, the same pressure field, the same velocity field, everything the same. But he removed the moisture from the hurricane. So when a hurricane makes landfall, it no longer has in situ source of moisture, but it has moisture stored in the hurricane from its path over the ocean. We call this term moisture. So he ran simulations where everything else is the same. He removed the storm moisture in the simulation. You can play God in the simulation and you just remove storm moisture. That's what Lynn did. And here is what you see. Two things immediately catch attention. One, the decay is way faster than when you allow moisture to be there. And the second, there is no memory of the temperature over the ocean. The two practically are indistinguishable from each other. One of the hurricanes was developed over 303 Kelvin, other at 299. So we are calling this dry hurricanes. It's of course just a numerical game, a computational game. But you can immediately see moisture is the key thing. The moisture that is stored in a hurricane, the storm moisture is the key thing that allows a slower decay. And the warmer the ocean, the greater the stock of the storm moisture, and therefore slower the decay. That's the conceptual connection. We still don't know what the exact process is, and that's what we are working on. But this, I hope, establishes the very first link that tells us that the moisture stored in a hurricane and some thermodynamic processes orchestrated by that moisture shows up as slower decay. So the conceptual understanding, yes, please. Actually, in, by removing moisture, you meant that the, um, the water vapor. Water vapor, water vapor. exactly. But the condensate is still there. That's correct. And, and actually, just to answer one more thing, when we remove the water vapor, we were worried that we are also changing the density of the air parcels, right? So how do I know? that it's not the density of the air parcel and some thermodynamic effect. We did not study it in this paper. I only thought about it later. So my current student actually did another simulation where he turned, did not remove the moisture. He just turned off condensation. In other words, the moisture condenses but does not release any latent heat. And the data is right on top of here. So it's not the density, it's really the thermodynamic effect that comes in. Now, how precisely it comes in, that's something we are studying. But the, the main theme is, is the condensation of the moisture that reflects as a slower decay. So if I now go back to the strange things that we were seeing before, ups and downs of the decay time scale, and ups and downs of the sea surface temperature, what was the correlation? I think we can make a claim that there is indeed a causal relationship between the two. When the sea surface temperature goes up, when the ocean is warmer, air temperature is also warmer, it can store, the hurricanes can store more moisture, and more moisture allows for a slower decay of the hurricane. So that's the causal relationship that we can look at. And of course, it has a very direct implication. For example, in the warming world, if I take, this is a typical decay curve I calculated using the decay time scale from 50 years ago. If I calculate the same decay of a hurricane making same landfall over here, this is the present decay time scale. And instead of time, I am putting it as a distance from the coastline, but I'm just using this time to distance translation by using translational velocity of a hurricane about five meters per second. And if let's say I am 400 kilometers away from the coast, really inland, you can see what's happening. 50 years ago, a category three hurricane at the coastline would come to me at around whatever, 15 meters per second, way below hurricane strength. But now it will come to me around 33 meters per second, hurricane category one. Right? So further and further inland areas are going to be affected because of slower decay of hurricanes. So that's a key message that we are putting in that particular paper. Now, let me talk a little bit more about some other effects that are also connected with moisture stored. Because is this from observation or uh, from your theory? This are basically what I did is I took, let me go back over here. From the observations that we had, for North Atlantic hurricanes, 
we took the time scale data 17 hours from 50 years ago and we took the time scale data 33 hours and that's how i calculated these two curves so this is a dk time scale of 70 hours and this is a dk time scale of 33 hours and e it's e to the power minus t over tau so it's an exponential yeah just to make a point that uh, further inland areas are going to experience larger intensity hurricanes. Okay, I want to now still stick with the theme of storm moisture, but I want to, instead of looking at the decay of a hurricane, I want to draw attention to another phenomena which I thought was quite interesting. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two different hurricanes that made landfall from the Gulf of Mexico over here. So this is Hurricane Rita that made landfall in 2005. This is the path of the hurricane. It made landfall over here. And here I'm plotting the intensity of the hurricane. Uh, again, the data is available in the Atlantic Herd at. And what you can see is this is over ocean. This is where it made landfall. The intensity decayed exponentially over the first day, continued to decay for the second day. And by the second day, when it reached all the way close to where I used to be in Illinois, the hurricane had completed, the storm had completely dissipated. Strangely, three years later, Hurricane Ike made landfall in a very, very similar area. It followed a path initially that was also very similar to Hurricane Rita. Over the first day past landfall, this hurricane also decayed very rapidly. But strangely, after one day, when the hurricane was over here, far away from the Great Lakes, no source of moisture, over here, the intensity started to go up immensely. And hurricane or the storm regained strength and continued all the way into Canada. So something happened. And what that something is, is extratropical transition. So this hurricane underwent extratropical transition, turned into an extratropical storm, and then continued to be active. So if you are a weather forecaster, which I guess many of you are, so you would be very interested to know which of these two fates is there for this hurricane. Because of course, the prediction is going to be absolutely and utterly different for the two cases. So therefore, extratropical transition is a topic of immense interest. This was all very new to me. I'm sure this is all very familiar to you, but this was all very new to me. So I had to put some effort with my student to try to understand what the basics of this transition are. So just so that I give the simple picture that we understood, this is the typical picture of the thermal structure of a hurricane over ocean. I'm showing you a cross section of the hurricane. This is the ocean. This is the secondary circulation of the hurricane and about the central axis. So this is the vertical axis. This is the radial plane, vertical radial plane. My primary circulation is like this. And of course, as I go up, it's going to reverse direction. The key thing to note here is that the secondary circulation comes to the bottom of the eye wall saturated with the moisture from the ocean. And as this saturated moisture goes up in the eye wall. It releases condensate and therefore heats up the eye wall. So the eye wall and the eye region, if I look at the temperature relative to the sounding temperature or relative to the temperature of the environment at the same altitude, I find that the eye wall temperature and the eye temperature is warmer than the sounding temperature. And that's why this is often called a warm core what one might expect, what happens in landfall, is that you cut off the ocean, thermodynamics processes are cut off, friction due to the ground is going to slow down this process. So this warm core should simply diffuse out and then come to equilibration with the surrounding. Keep that picture in mind. I'm going to contrast this with the extratropical transition. In an extratropical transition, which can be triggered in many ways, the one that is of interest to us is what happens when a decaying hurricane is coming through. If you have a very typical thing that you have a cold front and an extra on a hurricane, decaying hurricane, decaying storm is coming through, disturbs the cold front. Then 
the air, the cold air on the other side of the cold front, being colder is denser, is going to flow down onto the core of the hurricane and create a cold core storm. So an extra tropical storm is a cold core storm, but a hurricane is a warm cold storm. So the two have very, very distinct thermal signatures. And that's why one way to know whether or not a decaying hurricane is undergoing extratropical transition is to look for the formation of a cold core. And that's indeed one of the most common ways to look for extratropical transition. There is, you know, there are many systems, but basically many of them agree on this fact that the formation of this cold core is a, is a key fact to know whether or not extratropical transition is taking place. Now, let's ask what's happening to a hurricane that is coming and decaying over land. And importantly, in my sounding, I'm going to make the atmosphere stable. So here, I have baroclinic instability because my atmosphere is unstable. But I will make sure in my simulation that the hurricane is decaying in a stable atmosphere. If I do that, what happens? So here's a series of pictures. Here is at the moment of decay, and I'm plotting the temperature difference, the temperature anomaly of the hurricane. So temperature at any point minus the environmental temperature profile or the sounding temperature at the same altitude. And as expected, you have a warm core and so forth. And this black line you're seeing over here, I just seeded some particles down here just to show you the secondary flow that's hugging the eye wall of the hurricane. So we know where the eye wall of the hurricane is. It's pretty much towards the edge of the wall. If I now see how this hurricane, the thermal structure of this hurricane evolves as this hurricane decays. And remember, in the spin down model, no thermodynamic processes are active. What I should see is that this warm core diffuses out and we don't see anything interesting. Stable atmosphere. So no extratropical transition is possible. Here is what happens after 15 hours. And here's what happens after 30 hours. You see, there is a cold core that's growing from the bottom, and the warm core is shrinking. After 50, 30 hours, the cold core has grown even more, and the warm core has shrunk even more. So if the birth of the cold core is the key feature that tells me a decaying hurricane is undergoing tropical, extratropical transition, I would look at this and say, yeah, this one is undergoing extratropical transition. No such thing is possible because we prohibited such thing by giving it a stable atmosphere. Indeed, if I look at the intensity of this, it monotonically completely decays away. So something strange is happening that we are not able to understand if we look at it from the framework that does not take thermodynamics into account. But just by saying thermodynamics might give us this is not obvious. So let's see how at least we try to understand this phenomenon. So I'm going to focus on these streamlines going up along the eye wall of a hurricane. So from the bottom of the eye wall going all the way up. So imagine I look at an air parcel and I see how this is going up. The next slide is very obvious to everybody over here, but this is a typical temperature profile in the atmosphere from the ground all the way up to the tropopause, a typical lapse rate. Now, if I'm an air parcel starting from ground level going up, as you know, I have two choices. If my air parcel is saturated, I go up the moist area back, and I have a temperature that is higher than my profile temperature. That's why the warm core is created. When you go up, this parcel is releasing water. Moisture is condensing into water, releasing light and heat, and I have a warmer parcel. If, however, I have an unsaturated, partially saturated parcel, then I'm going to go up, expand without saturation first. So this is going to be the dry idea of that. Okay, so I have two paths to go up depending on my saturation level. Let's see what happens after a hurricane has made landfall. It does not have in situ access to moisture. The moisture that is stored in there is being consumed. So the air parcels that are coming at the bottom of the eye wall are arriving unsaturated. 
So initial part up is this dry is moisture just expanding like a dry air parcel, and that adiabatic expansion cools the parcel. As the parcel cools, the moisture level of the thing is not changing, but the saturation moisture is changing. So at some point, the parcel turns saturated, and then it follows the path of the moist adiabatic. That level, as you know, is the level of condensation, and where it crosses my atmospheric profile is the level of free convection, because beyond it, it is warmer than the surrounding and convect freely. But importantly, what you can see is that as this unsaturated parcel is coming in, because it will follow a dry adiabat initially, and even the initial part of the moist adiabat is below the atmospheric profile, you are going to have a cold core. And that is going to be created at the expense of the warm core above. And as time goes on, air parcels arrive at the bottom of the eye wall more and more unsaturated. And therefore, it has to go to higher and higher altitude, cool down more and more before you reach the level of condensation. And then your cold core keeps growing at the expense of the warm core. So the picture, the conceptual picture of a land falling hurricane, the core of a land falling hurricane we propose is that not a warm core that simply boringly diffuses away, but a warm core that shrinks and a cold core that forms and goes up. If we simply take the birth of a cold core to be a telltale signature of extratropical transition, we are bound to make errors. Instead, what we can see here is that the cold core here necessarily is at the low altitudes. If a hurricane storm is coming and hitting a cold front, and creating a cold core out of that, you'll have a much deeper cold core. But here, you'll have a cold core that forms from the bottom and then very slowly grows up. That, we propose, would be a better way to distinguish between extratropical transition and something that's just simply decaying on its own. And the key notion there, again, is to account for storm moisture and realize that Moist thermodynamic processes play a key role in the decay. of So if this work is of interest to you, uh, we have just very few papers about this. Uh, in this paper in 2020, we first identified the notion that warming world has a direct effect on how the hurricanes decay. Specifically, the warmer the sea surface temperature, the slower the decay of a land falling hurricane. In a subsequent 2022 paper, we actually looked at many, many more aspects of data analysis because smoothing and all this sort of stuff, you have to be very careful about errors and so forth. So these two papers are connected with the idea of DK. In this presentation, I only focused on the sea surface temperature. But there is also a contribution in the nature paper here and 2022 paper also. We looked at many other factors too. And to just come to the punchline, what we find is that majority of the slowdown of the decay is because of warmer ocean. But there is another contribution too. There is a slight shift in the latitude, in the longitude of the land falling position for the hurricanes. So there is a track change contribution also. When a track would change, that means your hurricane is subjected to different friction areas. In the east coast of America, you have regions that are rougher versus regions that are smoother. So when you change track, there's a contribution that's coming from there. And through various kinds of statistical analysis, what we estimated is that about 75% of the slowdown of the decay is because of the warmer ocean. And 25% is because of track changes. We also looked at all kinds of other factors that we could imagine, uh, landfall intensity, size of the hurricane, so on and so forth. So a, a more detailed analysis, if you're interested in it, I would suggest these two papers. And the third paper is basically the last part of my talk, which is this birth of a cold code. Uh, we published this. This journal is quite well known in fluids community, some of you fluids know this, but perhaps not in meteorological community. So uh, if that work is of interest, 
I would be very grateful if you take a look at this paper. And before I finish, let me just acknowledge um, all the work was done by a student who was funded by my institute. So without a very good student, as every faculty here knows, it's very difficult to do good work. So I'm acknowledging my uh, institute, OIST. Uh, we were also able to use the computing facilities uh, for the access symmetric simulation. You can run it on your laptop. But the 3D simulation, you really need a cluster. So we are very thankful for our scientific uh, resources that are provided. I was also, I'm also very thankful that we were able to uh, discuss with various people about different aspects of this research. And to Chris Lance and Frank Marx for giving us um, questions, uh, answering questions about Atlantic data. The data is available freely, but we wanted to also check, is there a systematic time difference kind of a systematic error change in the data? Because if the data gets more reliable now, as opposed to before, any trends that you might find in the data, maybe because the data is more reliable, the error bars are smaller. But what turns out very nicely, and we do this analysis, is that when you calculate the DK time scale, you take a difference of velocities, difference of intensity. So whatever is the systematic error cancels out. And that's why the improvements in the number of weather stations, in fact, does not matter to the analysis that we do. The trends that we identify, I suspect, are indeed robust trends. So with that, I thank you very much. It's been very kind for you to listen. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, thank you, Professor Pinaki, for a, a very interesting uh, presentation. I am sure there are many questions from audience because this is also at the heart of our research and tropical cyclones, not hurricanes, but tropical cyclones. So I will, I have my my own questions, but I'll wait until everyone else finish. Where do I begin? Siddharth, can you pass the mic? <clears throat> I must say this is an excellent talk, very clean analysis. After a long time, I could hear a very nice talk and uh, understand uh, most of the things what you have explained in a very layman's language. I only understand things in layman's language. So <laughs> this is one of the things of coming from outside in a field. I had to really simplify everything because otherwise I had no way to understand it myself. <laughs> So a uh, couple of questions. Uh, first one is when you are saying that uh, the decaying exponential intensity of hurricane, it reminds me of many of the major phenomena such as radioactive decay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Somehow the parameters which you are looking at has to be, I mean, the rate of decay has to be proportional, linearly proportional to the same thing. Yes. So I, I, I'm not sure where that is coming from. Yeah. That's number one. And uh, um, number two, <clears throat> Is uh, you have considered all the thermodynamic factors, mm -hmm. but uh, one thing uh, also you mentioned that that the, uh, that the tracks have changed, yes. right? Yes. So uh, one of the factors in in the, in the changes in the vorticity of cyclone it, it comes from the conservation of potential vectors, mm -hmm. which is plus F, right? So when the 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 hurricane or cyclone moves away from the tropics, mm -hmm. essentially your Coriolis parameters goes down and at the ex I mean goes up and the expense of that your vorticity also comes down. So so that has been taken into account or not. Okay. not yeah. sure. So we, let me answer your first question first. So your first question effectively asks about this part of the DK, which is a, a day past landfall, there is an exponential decay. And as you noted, I mean, if the DK is exponential, what that suggests is d by dt or the deceleration of the velocity has to be proportional to the velocity and then you get an exponential decay right now this is a purely empirical factor and because we can make a friction model to say that d by dt which after all is acceleration so therefore is proportional to force if the force has a linear dependence on velocity then you would get an exponential decay but with an exponential decay, you can come up with many other models too. So we just took this as an empirical data, just like many others. So for example, the Kaplan di Maria fitting is also just assuming it's exponential decay. But as far as I know, 
There isn't any nice, clean way to get that except the spin down model. Now, the spin down model does not give you an exponential, but you can tweak the parameters of the spin down model also to fit the first day pass DK. Part of like cyclones, so the changes in uh, the difference between central pixel and the mm -hmm. pixel outside yes. that track essentially drives your velocity. Yes. velocity. Yes. So if your changes in the central pixel and the ambient pressure yes. goes in the same way, then you can. It, it indeed does. So yeah. people who study the intensity decay also tr try to look at because all these databases give you the intensity, they also give you the p minimum. So you can then calculate the delta P and then see how the delta P is increasing, so how the delta P sorry, is decreasing as this hurricane DK is taking place. So our P min is increasing, right? So this idea over here, oops, sorry. You can also then fit an exponential curve on that DK. Uh, you can, people have tried to relate the two together, but then you have to also assume a velocity field for the surface, like it's a modified Rankine vortex to connect the V max, which is the intensity, with the delta P. So empirically, the two actually give you very, very consistent results. But one thing I would point out is that in any of this, you are going to have to grapple with this DK time scale tau. And then ask what physical parameters set that DK time scale tau. And what we suggest is that one of the key parameters that missing in our analysis is the storm moisture, which is not to say that's the only parameter, but there are certainly other parameters too. The other question you asked about the tracks. So in the tracks, what we did is we looked at systematic trends in the position of the landfall. We also looked at so we have you know, four points past landfall. We also looked at the centroid of those points. And in latitude, we could not find any systematic trend. But in longitude, we did find systematic trend. So the idea of the F parameter being different, I don't think that would be a major consideration here because in latitude, we are not finding any systematic trend. So my guess, is that the 25% contribution that's coming from the longitude might be coming because of surface friction. But we have not done any real analysis there to get that causal relationship clearly. We have only statistical analysis there. So it's, it's not a very convincing answer, but that's, that's basically what we have done. Thank you. Uh, there is a question there, Ganathi has asked. No? OK. <laughs> I saw it. I raised hand. Any other question? Madam? Anybody else? Uh, they will come up. Okay. I have um, two questions. One is uh, relating to the first part, where you, you mentioned that the moisture, the water vapor is taken off. Yes. In, so what will happen uh, is that the condensate, indeed, the, it will be dry air will be entering the storm. Yes. So it will indeed evaporate very fast, so it would indeed cool the. Yes. So that is what uh, probably is happening in Absolutely. the first case, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So the storm decays very, very rapidly. quickly. Very and rapidly. indeed, as you just said, you know that whole warm core uh -huh. it dissipates it very rapidly into a cold region, and that's indeed the region where it dissipates uh, decays so fast. Decays so yes. fast because it, there is no latent heating further happening exactly. there to sustain the storm exactly. further. Exactly. So that whole air parcel is going up the dry idea bed, and therefore it cools down immensely. Yes. And the second part is re relating to that uh, cold core. Yes. Um, suppose uh, that region has some soil moisture. Yes. Moisture. Yes. 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 See, but, um, I was curious if you tried some sensitivity experiments by introducing more moisture yes. Yes. at that point. Of okay. Time. So yes. Yeah. yeah. I have not done that, but Dan Chavez's group at Purdue, they did by doing landfall simulation and systematically varying the soil moisture. But what they were studying was the velocity profile of the surface winds. Now, what you're raising is a very interesting question because what you're asking is what happens to this cold core formation? Because my guess would be that 
the cold core rate that is going is going to slow down because you are going to have parcels that are coming in that are not saturated but not less unsaturated and there's probably a technical way to say it but i don't know that part yeah it's a bit more moist than the yes yes and i i, I am guessing that that's what would happen but we have not run these simulations and this is a very interesting idea that i would like to actually talk. i am getting some ideas for even some of the work that we are doing mm -hmm. uh, not for hurricanes indeed for convective okay systems yes. and all so yeah thank you very much for thank you very and nice just to add one more thing to the first part of your question you know if the, the very idea that a dry hurricane would create this cold thing and decay fast is already telling you thermodynamics is key to understand what's going on so the idea of a non thermodynamic vortex actually the spin down model the greatest charm of the model is you get an analytical equation for the decay but when you look at the assumptions that went into derive that it's actually incompressible constant temperature fluid it is really that t swirling around and friction against the ground so it's very tempting to see a decaying curve and then take this guy there are three parameters there and then you can just fit that curve and say voila it's done the two must be there must be some sense to it it could be like a part part by so. friction part by I the think so. yes and friction and this is i think also related because after all the secondary flow is driven by ekman pumping which is directly connected with friction so i think the ekman pumping sets the rate at which this moistures partially moist moistures are coming and being fed in so these are theoretical models we are trying to develop with my current student it's hard work <laughs> and we are one step forward 10 steps backward stage right now it's a lot of microphysics <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you thank you yeah any other question oh, yes yeah, sir a very very interesting very nice talk thank you now if you look at these tracks have you done any analysis looking at the tracks which are parallel to the coast ah, there are many cases yes right? yes yes versus yes. the one which are going perpendicular to the yes. coast yes so we did an analysis where we looked at the angle angle exactly. right yeah. yeah and we did not find any systematic trend there but uh, a group in china they classified the different tracks the overall shape of the track in different categories uh, this is actually when the second paper that i listed over here is a response to comment that was generated by their work so you see there is this land falling hurricane track mode so they classified into different kinds of shapes of track but not just with the angle which was your question and we and we did take a look and we did not find any systematic trend there but they looked at the whole shape of the track and they claimed that there's actually an influence of whether it's type 1 type 2 type 3 that kind of thing so uh, it's a claim that they have made that the track mode actually does matter but in the analysis we did which was just looking at exactly what you asked for Uh, we did not find any. Now another one, like if you look at the uh, the decay, right? Yes. Uh, do you see any uh, trend in the observations? Like observed? In yes, yes, of course. So the, this part that we were that I initially started with, um, for example, these are all simulations. But the first part of my talk. But then you have another one comparing this versus the SST. Yes. So now, if you look at this, prior to 2010, or mm -hmm. you don't see real uh, yes. trend. Yes. Yes. But you see a drastic uh, trend. Very true. Uh, maybe around 2005 or after yes. 2005. Very true. And what happened? I mean, what, yeah. what is this? What is so special? Yeah. After that, but if you look at the SST trend, mm -hmm. SST there's an anomaly, like after 2010, but that. the case the scale if you see that is happening much before yes maybe around 2005 so what could have uh, led to that it's a good question and i don't have an answer to it but we did notice that and actually if we don't fit a single linear trend throughout and we split it 
into two. Then you can actually see that initially there's a, a slight decrease. But then instead of the decay time scale becoming double, if this picture is the right picture, then you actually have a much larger increase and the projection for the future is even worse. But if we take this, you actually have basically no trend in the SST. And in the SST also, you have an increasing trend over here. Now, these are North Atlantic. And as I understand it, this has to do with the Clean Air Act. So the role of air salts in regulating the temperature of the North Atlantic. So the fact that Clean Air Act was initiated, I think Tara would probably know this way better than I do, but all I know is that uh, air soils are supposed to be the reason why the heating of the SST in the North Atlantic was more or less under control until about late 80s or early 90s. And after that, because the air soils were removed because of the Clean Air Act, you have seen the sea surface temperature in the Atlantic grow much faster. So I suspect that the trend that we are seeing over here might be related with this, but it's really hard to pass down the data because as we chop down in time, we have fewer and fewer events to analyze. So I'm not sure how confidently I can make that claim. And, and uh, now if you look at yeah. the recent years, the so fall, right? There's a decadal, very clear decadal variability. Yes, both. I think so. But we actually, since that student graduated, I have not looked at after 2018. And and can you please tell like how in a model you disconnected the ocean, remove the ocean? Oh sure, yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So I can tell you about that. In the model, these are the equations okay. that we specify okay. for the model, right? We also have to specify boundary conditions, and in the boundary conditions, what you have to specify is what is called Q in the flux that's coming in. And in this Q, in there are two contributions. So think only the data and heat are fluxes. Both fluxes. So as latent heat as well as sensible heat flux. So there are two terms there. One is coming because of the temperature difference between the air and the sea surface temperature. So that's the sensible heat flux. And another is coming because of the saturation difference between the boundary layer and the ocean underneath. So that's the latent heat flux. We turned off both the fluxes. Okay, both this is to turn off both. That was. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we wanted to make things very, very simple. But if you actually, well, we have to turn off the latent heat flux. So I think your question is what is the hypothesis to turn off the sensible heat flux? Right? We wanted to keep it very simple. But if we allow the sensible heat flux to be still on and we keep the ground at the same temperature as the ocean, then you basically don't see much of a difference. If you start to change the temperature of the ground, you would see slight effect of the temperature of the ground, but really the basic trends still remain the same. We wanted to just create the simplest kind of a possible scenario. So that's why we just turned everything on. In the real on. world, that's why- in, in real world, absolutely. There's going to be a contribution that's coming from there. The real world, there's also be a contribution of what Tara mentioned about soil so, moisture. Right. Basically, you only played around with the turbulent fluxes, right? Yes, yes. Turbulent exchange, exchange is, is, is completely off. But in real world, there would be these parameters also that would come in, absolutely. Yeah, okay. any other questions? So I, I, I made an observation listening to your uh, presentation. The observation is that the cyclone intensity is not changing at landfall in these 30, yes. 40 years. But you said the moisture, it gets from the ocean increasing because SST warming, and that moisture is not condensed, rather it is used to increase the lifetime over the land. Yes. That's what it happens. Yes. yes. So question is, why this moisture in, is not condensed over the ocean and it intensifying rather than it keeping as a reserve to expand its life? Okay. Why is that? Right. So when I showed that data, which is this data over here, we are looking at the intensity at landfall. Right. right. Now, depending on the path of the hurricane, typically the maximum intensity of the hurricane is reached before it has come close to coast. So if we look at the maximum intensity of a hurricane 
And that was kind of like what's going on over here. And if we just focus on the fraction of the major hurricanes, then what we see is that over time, there is a preference for higher intensity hurricanes. But that is the proportion of major hurricane hurricanes over ocean. Ocean. It's ocean. not intensity. So proportion of major, yes, it is not. So, but this is intensity. This My is intensity. question is, yes. the, psych, uh, the hurricanes tend to keep the moisture to increase its life right. rather than generate energy by condensing it. Okay. Why is that? Right. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that it's not a rather than scenario. So if we take the simplest case, which is that more the moisture in a hurricane over ocean, higher its intensity would be. Suppose. Suppose. Yes. If we suppose that, then if I just plot the maximum intensity of hurricanes over ocean over time, and if I look at sea surface temperature increasing over time, I should see that the maximum intensity of a hurricane should also go up. Mm. But we actually don't see that. That's exactly right? my observation. That yes. means the moisture it is it is storing but not using. Yes. So then the question is, what's going on over there, right? So is that that uh, thermodynamically there is a threshold up to which only they can use moisture to generate energy in a cyclone? What I understand, I have not worked in this area, but what I understand from listening to people like Kerry. Maybe Mann, cy cyclone people can get this answer. A cyclone has any threshold level of moisture beyond which it can't use. I suspect it probably, I have looked at the uh, trend in tropospheric, I mean, tropopore temperature because hmm. actually, yes. if both are getting at the same rate, yes. your efficiency of the cyclone is yes. the same. Yes. T of the cold in terms of reservoir, yes. T of warmer reservoir versus colder reservoir, both are increasing at the same rate, is you should not see any changes in the intensity. Okay. That's explained the intensity not changing, yeah. but moisture holding is changing. Yeah, holding that is used to over the land. That's a, an, another interesting another, point. Another one more point you can note here is when when you say that the decay time, decay time is increasing, that time if you look at the intensity. The intensity falls that time. Oh, it is this part, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It is just a going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the opposite direction. Yeah. And the, the the time when the decay decay is falling, yes. then the intensity is going up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's very curious. Yeah. It's a not one yeah. decay. Yeah. Yeah. And this is of the yeah. 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 very observation. Yeah. This is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Second part of my observation is that uh, even after we if we accept your theory, how the the warm core. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and diffuses after landfall, you have a propose, proposal that is a cold core emanating from the surface yeah. and warm tend to shrinking. make shrinking. Yes. But then uh, then you you told us that how hurricanes translate into a extra tropical system. I think if your theory is right, what happened to the cyclone as a perturbation is it is leaning against the background. Mm -hmm which is a conducive condition, it can derive energy from the extratropical circulation. Mm -hmm. So it must be a simple aerotropic or bioclinic instability, which tend to grow the cyclone in the extratropics into a little bit. In, 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 actual, in actual, because in, in the simulation, we purposefully turn off any kind of barotropic possibility by picking the sounding that does not allow us for ha having any bioclinic in, uh, barotropic instabilities. You switched off the baroclinic instability in your model. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm confusing the two. Okay. So what we had done is our sounding is basically neutral sounding. Right. So we did. The perturbations are leaning against the neutral sounding. That's right. The yes. Perturbations yes. are getting more warmer yes. there and colder at the same That's time. correct. Yes. So in the lean ah, I see. I see. I see. It can okay. derive energy from the background. I see. I see. So it may be the reason a secondary bump in the group. That translate into secondary, sorry, tropic, uh, what do you call that? H higher. Um, the extra tropical transition. Transition. So this bump. Like that, uh, yeah. Must be derived from the background. See the track. It may be Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this bump, we don't see in our simulation. You will not see if you don't have baroclinic transition energy yes. in the model. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. second, uh, another point is that, uh, okay, so. Uh, your cyclone tend to stay longer over the land. Yes. In the, in the yeah. 
But when we see the correlation that Sir was also discussing, there are very many episodes they are not in place. Yes, that's absolutely true. So the 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 issue there is that if I look at individual cyclones that are making landfall, the time scale of individual cyclones can be affected by many, many, many factors. So that's the reason we are trying to look at much larger time scales and trying to see trends, whether or not we can identify trends. And that's another reason why we wanted to really see these things in simulations, where we can turn off every other thing and simply change one parameter. So before we could actually complement our observation analysis with the simulations, mm -hmm. I wasn't very sure if what we are saying is really sensible. If the decaying phase of cyclone is not observed by satellite by using brightness temperature, people work on that. Can you tell us? This can be observed, right? How the warm core is dissipating with a split structure and then... I am. I don't know because observational experts must be here. I know that the it's not possible to the profile of temperature. It is possible, right? It should be possible. Yeah, it should be possible. So it might, be, might have been observed. So I, that, I, I would love to see. Yeah. It's with the observation. Yes. Yes. So I would love to see actually observations of this. And whenever I've talked with somebody, they would say, "Well, we have to use some kinds of it." Doppler radar for this. Uh, this, this case, uh, the second case is from uh, which uh, year? Uh, this year, this case is 2008. Yes. So uh, there could be some radar observations. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, over India, we can use radar observation to see the decaying phase and, and see whether the theory. Here, uh, they yes, have also definitely there are, ah, there are yeah. data. Yeah. I, I couldn't find anything, but again, I was probably not looking at the right places. So we had the simulation thing, and we understood at least in a simple way. So they have a mosaic of many radars. Mm -hmm. With that, they make a mosaic of all the observation, a 3D okay. over the region. So whenever there are clouds, yeah. rain, you get uh, observations okay. from okay. Okay. Any other question? Otherwise, we'll uh, thank Professor Pinaki for this excellent talk. Thank you.